Hello to everyone, and I just want to say what a privilege it is to be the first Heritage Lecture of this new series, so really pleased to be here. Um, and obviously grateful to Sue for inviting us to speak about our work. So obviously most of you don't know me, so I'll just start with a bit of a background about uh, the company I work for and, and, and about me. So I work for a company called Hearst Conservation, which was founded in 1986. Um, the founder is Elizabeth Hurst. She, uh, she trained with two of the most eminent conservators in their, of their time in stone and wall painting conservation, Professor Robert Baker and Eve Baker. Um, Liz has gone on to become an internationally renowned and respected conservator. And our projects range from nationally to internationally. We currently have two international projects going on um, at present, as well as this wonderful project in Manchester. Um, so our team br uh, uh, bridges a wide range of different specialisms. So I'll be talking about um, um, the, the conservation of the murals and the painted ceilings, but actually our team also has plaster and stone specialists. Um, and many of, our, many of our team are also uh, accredited members of the Institute of um, Conservation, which is our professional body. So I'm the conservation manager for Hearst Conservation. I trained in the 1990s in conservation science and conservation and restoration. I have a, a, a sort of a wide range of experience in different conservation projects. My main specialism and my absolute passion is architectural paint research, but that's a, a subject for another day. We'll touch on it briefly in this lecture, but um, I could talk for an hour separately on that quite easily. So... <clears throat> So yeah, we're really truly fortunate at Hearst because we're involved in some of the most spectacular heritage um, in the UK, but also because we have this really strong community of practice both within our team and also with other specialists that we reach out to. Um, I think in conservation we're constantly learning. We're constantly learning new things and, um, about history, but also about new, new techniques as well. Really, when I talk about conservation tonight, I'll be talking about... Um, the work here, but everything that we do is underpinned by research and analysis. We need to understand the history of what we're working on and the historic technology, so the materials and techniques that, the, that were used originally. We need to understand what interventions have happened historically and also um, what may be causing any signs of deterioration. So we do a lot of work before we ever start to actually conserve um, a finish. I just included this slide because it sort of encompasses a wide, a very wide range of, of different things, including me being chased by one of the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, which was a long time ago. So we as a company have been fortunate to work here at the Town Hall uh, over the last two decades, uh, starting in 2004 when we started looking at paint finishes within the building and undertaking research, and also condition surveys on joinery and stonework. Um, more recently, in, in 2018, we, we undertook a much more uh, extensive campaign of architectural paint research, which we took thousands of samples from the building. Um, and like I said, I won't go into it too much, but basically we look at those samples down the microscope like an archaeologist looks at layers of soil to understand um, the number and nature of coatings that are extant. So... <clears throat> um, we also undertook at that time a condition survey of the Ford Maddox Brown murals, and it's with the murals that I'd like to start, but I'd like to caveat this talk by saying that I'm not an, uh, an art historian. Um, I will be looking at it from a conservator's point of view. So I'll be, more, I'll be focusing more on techniques and materials and previous intervention um, rather than the subject matter of the murals. Okay, so, um, so Ford Maddox Brown... I'm sure many of you probably know the subject matter in greater depth than I do, but he was an, an eminent painter of, pre of the pre-Raphaelite movement. His most significant paintings are considered to be The Last of England, which he painted in 1855, and Work, which he painted over a 13-year period completed in 1865. And Work is considered to be one of the greatest 19th century paintings, and it can be viewed in Manchester Art Gallery. So... Um, this is Romans building a fort at uh, Mancini and dated, and this was painted in 1880. Um, uh, Maddox Brown was commissioned to paint the, the uh, murals together with a local artist, Frederick Shields, but eventually Shields withdrew from the task, so it, that left it all to, to Maddox Brown to paint the entire 12 scenes, um, of which there were six to each side of the hall. He completed the first seven murals in situ on site 
Um, but the last five he actually painted on, uh, on canvas in his studio, and then they were fixed to the walls after that. They weren't, fi they weren't completed in the same order uh, as they appear on the walls. The earliest, the baptism of Edward, was completed in 1879, with the last of the paintings being completed in 1893, um, he actually finished painting Bradshaw's Defence of Manchester after he had had a stroke and he, he unfortunately died in the same year. So this is the first painting to be completed. This is the baptism of Edwin. Um, so thinking about the materials that he used, um, he used a, a painting method known as spirit fresco, which was made from resin, wax, copal and spike oil of lavender. Um, so, and the latter being a sort of akin to turpentine, it's a solvent. This method actually was used quite widely by the great ecclesiastical decorators firms throughout the, the 19th century because it was believed to offer uh, superior longevity and it also gave them a greater palette of colour and, and vibrancy. So this is the expulsion of, uh, of the Danes from Manchester, which is dated 1881. So in terms of his technique, working with spirit fresco the, um, is applied to dried plaster. So this is where it differs from a true fresco. So when we think of the Sistine Chapel, um, it, um, uh, Michelangelo obviously painted in true fresco. And that is the application of pigments to fresh plaster. So as the plaster sets, it, it encapsulates the pigments and sets them. So, obviously in Italy there are many examples still remaining, but actually it's not a terribly durable finish for the UK because of the climate. But also, um, it has other challenges, so um, it's, it has a limited working time. It also has a limited range of pigments, because a lot of pigments are affected by the plaster. They, they, they change colour because of the alkalinity of the plaster. Um, and its open, porous surface would become spoiled very quickly in a, in a sort of... Um, Victorian industrial city. So uh, Gambier Perry's spirit fresco offered a long working time, greater range of colours and um, it was hoped by the artist using it that it would be much more resilient against dirt and pollution um, and also against uh, condensation and moisture movement but unfortunately the, the, the latter two um, uh, have proved to be um, quite an issue with spirit fresco paintings. So we're really lucky that we've got Maddox Brown's account of working on the spirit frescoes uh, on the Manchester Town Hall paintings. He, and in his, in, in his account, he considered the ease of cleaning. He considered it essential that the surface should be resilient enough to wash, stating, to my own experience, the Gambier Parry fresco will wash. I've tried with soap and a nail brush on a small specimen, be specimen before beginning the wall itself, and it looked as well after the operation as before. Italian fresco, whatever they say, will not wash. So needless to say, we will not be washing the murals <laughs> with soap and a nail brush. <laughs> so this is the establishment of Flemish weavers in Manchester, and this painting is dated 1882. So the first step in the spirit fresco technique, as described in his account, is several applications of this, the spirit fresco medium, which if I'm trying to sort of equate it to a, 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 a sort of common material, it would be similar to a, a varnish type um, material. So the intention of doing this is that it would penetrate the plaster because raw plaster is quite a hungry surface and if you went straight on with colour, it would actually suck the binder from that and the, the pigment would not bond to the surface and fail. So we've, when, he, when he put the medium on and then he started applying the colour in the same medium, the oil of spike lavender in that reactivated the medium. So in effect, we're sort of getting a fresco bonding um, to the surface in a, in a, um, not quite in a similar way to a true fresco, but that, that intention is there that you've got that bond. So this one is the trial of Wycliffe and um, this was dated 1880. So we start to see the, past, the, the, the years are not chronological as we go through these. Um, so we know that the plaster substrate was applied in advance of the painting, which would have reduced any risk of the alkaline plaster breaking down the spirit fresco. Um, 
the plasters of the first five murals that we've, we've looked at, so this is the fifth one, are smooth and contain marble dust, which Brown commented on, saying, the spaces have been filled in with a compound of lime and marble dust, fine and hard. Mr. Parry in his pamphlet, called Spirit Fresco Painting, recommends a stucco composed of two parts pure river sand and one of Welsh Lake lime. I do not fancy the change of sand for marble dust would have in itself caused much difference, had not the plasterer troweled the surface far too smoothly, till it was like ivory, in fact. So he's trying to work with a really smooth surface, and he goes on to say, to remedy this, I had the faces of the panels cut down with grit stone, then to increase the absorbency of the stucco, it was before receiving the first preparation, well heated with a gas apparatus contrived for the purpose. So he's basically reverse engineering the, the right surface to, uh, to um, receive the, the works. So um, this is the proclamation regarding weights and measures, and this was painted also in 1880. So interestingly, mural six and seven, this being uh, mural six, they're not as smoothly polished. They're quite rough textured. It's been previously assumed that they're executed in, in river sand, but given that both of these paintings are 1880, chronologically, there's no logical reason why they would vary. So we don't know whether that is the case that it is different materials, because obviously we can't take a sample of the plaster without damaging the mural. So we, we, we don't know whether it's a case that it's different materials or receive different surface preparation, as he was adjusting his technique. Um, this is the second of those um, plaster panels with the, the more textured surface. This is Crabtree watching the transit of Venus. This one is dated 1883. And then we move on to the, um, the panels that I've already spoken about that are actually painted on canvas and adhered to the wall. And this one is um, Cheatham's Life Dream, dated 1886. So the late, these are the later uh, range of paintings. So the most common way of attaching the, um, the canvas to the wall, and very common in a lot of 19th century decorative interiors, is the use of lead, lead white paste. And this is a technique we know as marouflage. So basically, the paste is due to, to adhere the canvas to the wall. And of course, the chain, this change in approach allowed, allowed Maddox Brown to work from London to complete his later paintings. Uh, running through these remaining canvas paintings, we have Bradshaw's Defence of Manchester, which is dated 1893. And this is the one I spoke of that is the, um, his final piece. John Kay, inventor of the fly shuttle, which is dated 1890. Uh, number 11 is the opening of the Bridgewater Canal. This is dated 1892, and this one we will return to because this has some more, uh, this has more complex conservation needs than the other ones that we've really um, covered so far. And the final painting in the sequence is Dalton collecting marsh gas fire, and that's dated 1887. So, in terms of the history of the, um, the, the conservation history of the murals, we know that they have received work on, on various occasions. And we know that from contemporary accounts in the archives. Um, so we're able to draw on that to understand more about the, um, their history after completion. So, we know that... Um, from contemporary accounts that the surfaces within the town hall became dark with pollution very quickly, and the murals were no exception. In, 19, in, sorry, in 1896, which is only three years after the completion of that final mural, um, <clears throat> the paintings were, were cleaned and coated with um, what is described as a solution that intersperses a shield against the ill effects of sulfurated air, um, which is almost certainly an application of a varnish. Uh, it's it. And if we look at the slide, um, if drawing out the detail, the little inset shows two of the murals, which look incredibly dark in this image. Now, black and white photos can be um, can, can give us an in, incorrect uh, um, picture due to lighting, but they really do appear that the murals by, uh, in 1909 were um, incredibly discoloured. So using the archives, we've been able to draw together a chronology of intervention. And we can see that actually the murals have required work um, 
on, on, on various occasions. So after 1896, we had further works in 1919 to, um, to varnish and retouch and repair. Um, they're also potentially resetting back some of the canvases. Um, in 1927, Tristram, who is... Um, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. In, in 1929, Tristram, who um, is very famous for publishing some wonderful volumes on medieval um, wall paintings and was... Um, as it says, Professor of Design at Royal College of Arts, he undertook further work to the murals, introducing wax to the surface as a way to try and protect them, but actually um, the, the, the wax in itself is very problematic to, to paintings, and we, we, we find where this treatment was undertaken quite often that, that it's associated with failure and deterioration, both through changing moisture dynamics, but also surface tension and discoloration and, and various other issues. So in 1959... That, that, that treatment was then reversed um, by reducing the wax coating, um, removing food and drink deposits, because this is a working building, and um, inevitably um, food and drink come into contact with the murals. Um, filling losses and retouching. And then further surveys through the 1980s, and in 1995 to 98, um, the last scheme of conservation in which um, the flaking areas were consolidated, retouching was undertaken, and it was varnished to protect it. Oh, sorry, no, it wasn't varnished. I take it back. Um, so we, this is the surface that we are now left with today. So in 2018, um, as I've already said, we went back and we, we've undertaken detailed condition surveys of all 12 murals. This is my colleague, Lucy Kozhovska, who is our senior icon accredited paintings conservator and working to undertake the survey. So I should say at this point that working on murals is very different to working on an easel painting because it's attached to the building fabric. So it's subject to any issues that the building faces, such as water ingress or structural movement. It's much, also much harder to control the environment and limit stresses and damage um, in these circumstances. The murals, as I've mentioned, are also part of a working building, so as such they're subject to wear and tear in the patina of age, or they have been. Um, and we'll see that as we go through the, 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 the sort of small areas of damage are commensurate with the use of the room. So when we undertake a, a painting survey, the first thing we tend to do as conservators is look outside, because what's happening outside affects... Um, the conditions that the paintings are subjected to on the inside. So looking at the south elevation here, um, I don't have a pointer to be able to point, sorry, but um, there, there's downpipes running down in the locations where the murals are situated, so we can see where the murals are by, in the red boxes. Um, and in particular, the Bridgewater Canal 11, the, the downpipe, the area around it, is very clean, which suggests that we've got water runoff happening there, possibly because there's a leak. Um, the, uh, and we do find that the most obvious causes of deterioration are often the culprits, so the rainwater goods might be blocked, they may have insufficient capacity, and they may leak or have failed joints, um, and they often cause water ingress. Other points of ingress are um, loss of pointing, and cracks to masonry, deteriorated stonework, together with leaking windows. None of which I think are particularly... So th that's generally when we're looking at a building, but um, I think the key issue here is probably that downpipe. So we looked at... Um, we also used infrared thermal imaging, really, uh, just as an indicative... To, to understand the sort of indicative heat distribution across the surface. So this was undertaken prior to the building closing for the Our Town Hall project. The heat... The hall was heated by the Alfred Waterhouse... Um, design for the heating, which is um, hot water coils under the arches, uh, behind the tin, situated behind the timber dado that we've seen below the murals. And then there are flues behind each of the murals. Now, ordinarily, as a conservator, that would sort of concern us that, that there's diff different temperatures, so you've, you've got vari variation in temperature through day and night, and when the heating's on and off. Um, but actually, it does seem to have stood the murals in good stead because generally they are 
um, in good condition. And of course, we've got air movement behind them and they're stepped away from the wall, so much less at risk from moisture penetration through the wall. So obviously at the minute, the site is a building site. The heating has been maintained. The murals, as we saw in the video, and I will come back to as well, are being monitored very closely to establish if there is any risk to them. So they're monitoring the environment in each, at, at each mural surface. So every, every mural is being monitored. And the new heating system will replicate the original one to maintain the stability and conditions that the murals are used to. We also undertook a non-invasive moisture survey so that we could establish if there are any problems regarding um, moisture movement through the murals, but actually the, um, the survey found that they were essentially dry. We also tried to understand the location and, and scope of previous interventions. So this is a particularly gruesome uh, section of the expulsion of the Danes from Manchester. Um, and here we're looking at, um, at retouching, previous damage and that's been retouched. So this is invisible light, but if we switch to UV light, we can see that there's quite a long dark diagonal stretch which represents retouching. So different, different paints fluoresce in different ways. The spirit fresco fluoresces quite brightly, but the later acrylic retouching doesn't fluoresce, it absorbs the light, so it looks very dark. So we can see, um, we can start to compare where we know there is retouching. So we've got various surface accretions across the, um, across the murals, and again, this relates back to the, the, the working use of the hall. There are also some localised areas of cracking where the, the plaster is hollow, and um, this is quite a significant... It's small, but it's quite a significant piece of damage so we've got sort of knocks and abrasions, again, wear and tear, but um, this is obviously in quite a significant area as well. And relatively localised, but there are areas of flaking, so we can see here that the, the paint is detaching on, um, on, on the, the, the um, particularly on the, the pink um, colour field, but also on the face and hair. So... Originally, this was put down in the 1950s to the location of hot plates where food was served and the steam coming off them. But it's obviously been an ongoing issue, so um, there, may, there may be other underlying causes as well. So um, this, this area requires further in investigation. So I mentioned Mural 11 earlier, and we saw the outside with the downpipe. Um, so this is one of the paintings that's executed on canvas. On the right-hand side of the painting, um, there are actually salts coming through the canvas and paint film, which is you can see on the bottom inset picture, which indicates that moisture has been in ingressing through at that point. So presumably there's a bridge between the flue and the, um, uh, and the pillar inside, which means that the water's been able to, to come through. It's also affected the plaster that's supporting the paint, uh, the paint scheme. So... Um, Initially, we had assumed that we would secure the plaster as part of our, our protection works, but because of the vibration and various other things that are going on in, in the building, we were actually concerned that it may set up further issues. So at this point, we have stabilised it, and we'll look at some images of that shortly. So where we've got um, surface accretions, like this one, um, some, some organic material on the surface. We, we carefully removed that with a swab um, and, and deionized water before we went on to do other works. And likewise here as well, this is a before and after just of reducing that, um, that surface accretion. We then consolidated the flaking paint so that it was secured back. And then Subsequently to that, we applied um, a protective facing, which the video said was Japanese rice paper, but it's actually Japanese tissue paper. Um, so, which is a, a sort of non-woven, quite a strong but uh, breathable fabric. Uh, it's applied with a very reversible adhesive so that once the works to the, the town hall are complete, that can be removed. But at the minute, that's serving to protect the surface of, the, um, of each of the murals to, to keep them... To, to put them to bed, basically, to keep them safe and wrapped while the works are ongoing. And in this picture as well, we can see that we're 
this is the, the uh, Bridgewater Canal painting that where we were concerned about some detachment. So we used a composite aluminium uh, support to, to hold that in place. Nothing's fixed to the stonework. It's um, secured in place with foam blocks, top and bottom, just to, to ensure that um, the canvas doesn't move away from the wall during works. And that's that. So that's what they look like when they'd been faced. And I've put this one in as well. This is interesting. This is after the, um, the panelling below has been removed. So we can see the radiant panels that have the heated coils behind for the heating. Um, this is the, uh, an overview of the faced murals. So the, the, the facing that we put on protects them from dust and it, it keeps the surface sound. But because of the huge amount of work that's going in the hall, greater protection was needed. So Purcell, the architects, designed um, these self-supporting perspex and aluminium frames to sit in front of them. And if we move to the next slide, we can see that they have um, air gaps to allow for ventilation. And as I've said previously, each one of these has a, um, an environmental monitor in it to ensure that we can um, track the conditions and um, make sure that none of the murals are, have unfavourable conditions within them. And this is one of the reasons why they need to be protected. We can see them here. They've then further got um, sheeting over them to keep them fully protected. And this is during the scaffold erection for the Great Hall, so they, they really need to have um, sound protection to keep them safe during these works. So this is the stage the murals are up to at present, and um, the scaffolding's now coming down. There are other works to go on in the Great Hall, and then um, the conservation works the murals will follow later in the programme. So this is as far as I can really go at this point in time with the murals. But we can, in that picture, see the scaffold going up to uh, the rather spectacular Great Hall ceiling, so, um, which is the other part of our work that we've been undertaking. The, um, the, the ceiling itself is a powerful tribute to the innovation and trade of Manchester and its cotton industry. The imagery of, the textile, of textile manufacturers found it throughout this ceiling with intertwining ropes, cross shuttles, and a repeat use of the cotton plant. The significance of Manchester's international trade is also depicted in heraldic decoration to the ceiling panels, representing equally nations and cities showing their, uh, that shared their trading with the city. So the other thing that appears in great quantities on the ceiling is the industrious bee. Um, and I think I am correct. I've, I've tallied them up, and I think there's 1,008 bees on the ceiling, <laughs> all gilded and all very uh, yes, all very um, uniform. Um, the ceiling is vast, and it's hard to appreciate the scale of the ceiling until you actually get up to the panels. Each of the panels measures 3.8 meters high by 3.2 meters wide. They are quite something when you get up to, to them. So the ceiling is not by Ford Maddox Brown but by one of the great ecclesiastical stained glass companies, Heaton, Butler and Bain. And Heaton and Butler and Bain were prolific church decorators working across the UK. They're an English company with offices in Covent Garden. They were primarily designers and manufacturers of stained glass windows, but um, the company evolved and they became, as I say, one of the most prominent um, decoration companies. It was founded by Clement Heaton in 1852, and um, James Butler joined in 1855. Robert Bain uh, moved across from Clayton and Bell, which is another of the big ecclesiastical firms, and, uh, and they became known as Heaton, Butler and Bain. But actually, I believe they still shared the same offices with Clayton and Bell, so there was still a lot of crossover with them. So, between October and November 1875, an appropriate design, um, appropriate design and skilled practitioners were sought for by the council for ornamentation of the roof and ribs of the large hall. Tenders for the work were obtained from two companies, Heaton Butler and Bain of London and Manchester-based Robert Pollitt. Uh, after submission of drawings, Heaton Butler and Bain were requested to paint out a sample on a panel and on a rib 
for which they were paid £50. In January 1876, it's recorded the sample had been completed, enabling the Council Committee to assess the standard of work and um, determine further recommendations. And then in uh, February 1876, a final order was issued from the Council for Heatson and Butler and Bain to be employed to decorate the ceiling of the large hall at a cost not exceeding £1,600. Once they've been secured to undertake the decoration of the Great Hall, discussions commenced with the council meet, uh, in a council meeting of April 1876 to finalise the design. Um, and the, and uh, the re recorded dialogue is that, with regard to the decoration of the Great Hall, which the committee have assigned to Messrs Heaton, I believe the balance of uh, opinion was in favour of not confining the heraldic devices to the areas of towns in Lancashire, nor even England, but to emblazon those of our principal elites or countries of the world with which Manchester is connected commercially, and being quite of the opinion that the idea carefully worked out will give fine decorative result. We know that the decoration started in May at the earliest of that year and was completed by the 9th of November 1876 and the signatures from the Great Hall ceiling of Heath and Butler and Bain, the lower one here, um, actually dates November the 9th, 1876. And these are hidden away in the decorations on the ceiling. And then they struck the scaffold in December, so we're sort of 146 years almost to the day the scaffolding's coming down in the Great Hall now. This is Alfred Waterhouse's drawing of the Great Hall, which seems, um, which is, is is accurate more or less to the um, to the the Great Hall itself. So, on completion, the twenty-eight panels display the her heraldic shields and symbols of Manchester's principal trading partners. Uh, MacLeod, writing in the public hall in 1887, 1877, stated the following. The lines of principal timbers are emphasised by heavy gilding and the central space of each panel is occupied by a device representing the arms of a country or city in combination with other details, symbolising the arts or products with which the name or place, name of the place is most generally associated. It was the object of the architect who approved the design to connect in this way some of the principal towns of the kingdom and more especially to show the chief markets of the Manchester trade. So... Um, we know that the design is driven by Alfred Waterhouse from these, from these, uh, the drawing and the, the archive. So as seen today, the panels contain a red and beige border, a blue background with gilded and painted bees, all 1,008 of them. The, um, the name of the city and country is shown in gold on a red background with entwined cotton panels. We have repeat fish or spinning shuttle motifs. And interestingly, we'll come on to changes, but a lot of the spinning shuttle motifs started out at, at one length and were extended. And we assume that that's because actually people who were in the trade said the proportions aren't right. <laughs> um, we've, um, so the heraldic shields are set in a quatrefoil with, with the rope around it as discussed. So contemporary accounts suggest that the impression given by the newly decorated hall was one of strong colour. Um, in February 1877, Waterhouse stated that the whole of this decoration um, is on a blue field and is rich in colour and perhaps a pre at present a little overpowering because some strong colour, principally gold, black and vermilion, is applied to the oak of the roof. Waterhouse reassured his audience that the addition of the Ford Maddox brown murals to the lower walls would act as a ballast to the colour on the ceiling. In September 1877, so at the time of the opening, the Manchester Courier commented on the strongly marked colouring of the great... Um, the strongly marked colouring is necessary because of the great height of the roof and, it, and its semi-obscurity occasioned by the state of the atmosphere, which suggests that the pollution was really quite something to behold. Um, the reporter added, it is expected that in a year or two it will have toned down. <laughs> so um, before I move on, uh, just a, a quick comment on the paint medium. So I've talked quite a lot about the paint medium used by Ford Maddox Brown. Um, all of the evidence suggests that Heat and Butler and Bain worked in a similar material, wax-based material, not spirit fresco, but um, basically um, th there are various different... Um, recipes around spirit fresco and this, this was a, a, another one of those recipes 
um, which contained um, wax because it was believed to, to be resilient to the, to the climate. So we're just going to have a, a look at some of the original, uh, the, the, the fingerprints basically, although we haven't got any real fingerprints unfortunately, sometimes you do on sites, but um, the, the, um, the DNA left by Heaton, Butler and Bain. So um, the, sten the designs were applied by stencil and freehand and where we have use of stencil, we also have holes in, in the plaster substrate where they have tacked their stencils on and then just um, painted over them. So these are an important part of the record showing that original technique. On the gilded decoration, and I particularly love the lion with his tongue stuck out, um, we've got actually their original pencil marks where they're planning where to place the, um, to, to place the, the decoration on the main. The main has subsequently been overpainted, so a lot of the black that we see there is not, um, is not Heaton, Butler and Bain, but there are flashes of the uh, original one sort of grinning through from that. <laughs> We know that the cord detail was applied before further uh, embellishments were added. So this, the ships on, um, are on all the panels where they occur were applied. The, the, you can see that the rope is fully present underneath the ship. So the ships were then um, applied and gilded over the top of the cord. Moving on to um, the history of conservation. There's no known documentation relating to the conservation of, the, or, or should I say in our research to date, we have not identified any um, records of any conservation to the Great Hall ceiling. We've got one single reference to the condition um, in the 1979 council inventory that says some parts of the ceiling have been repainted, but this has been carefully done. The Manchester and Sulphur panels show signs of damp. We do have some archive photographs. We can see in 1877, uh, um, obviously freshly completed, the, um, the paintings look very clean and vibrant. And again, returning to that 1909 image, it does look like um, the whole of the interior was significantly darker by that point. But like I've said, it can be misleading. We've got images from the 1930s, which again show them in, uh, in good condition. And likewise, we've got images showing them in the 1950s also. But that's about as much documentary evidence as we have found. But luckily, um, people have left us records on the paintings themselves. So we've got, um, in 1894, we know that by this point, given that we know that the Ford Maddox Brown um, murals were cleaned within three years of the completion of the last one, we know that it was likely that the ceiling was, became dirty quite quickly. Um, so, in 1894, a team of painters went up and repainted all of the light-coloured sections, all of the, the sort of beige colours, um, presumably because we lost definition from the ground. So, by repainting those, it strengthened the def definition and returned contrast so that the designs could be seen. So, we've got this team of painters who have left their names in various different panels. <laughs> We've also got um, uh, 1958 and 1969 people um, coming in to, to do various works. And we've also got the occasional little uh, cartoon character peeping out from, ver from, uh, from the designs. <laughs> so from the evidence we've got, we've been able to sort of put together a timeline of what we know um, in terms of intervention. We're not able to say for certain where some of the, the dates at which some of the, the main interventions happened, other than basing it on the materials that are there. So there are some fairly major changes to the panels themselves. This is South Africa, but actually started out as Prussia. Um, and in fact, we've still got the Prussian attributes around the cord. It's only the central panel that's been updated. Um, we can see the name Prussia grinning through on the inscription below, um, which I'm sorry, I don't have a, an image of. But we also know that New Zealand started out as, Austri as Austria as well, and that's been overpainted to, uh, as well. And that had happened by 1930, because in the 1930s photos, you can see New Zealand. So um, we also have some other interesting um, artifacts. So in this image, underneath the rows, you can see that there is a ghost ship. And that also happens um, 
quite quite regularly. So uh, potentially a lot of these changes are original or very early to the ceiling. As part of the condition survey, we used the FLIR to actually, we were looking for areas of deterioration, but it was also really helpful in identifying underlying areas of gold. Um, so here on the FLIR image where we've got the yellow star, that's gold leaf that's underlying the current decoration. So while the team were working on the murals, they were looking up and thinking, well, we know that there's some flaking. We can see in the picture that there's some flaking, but it appears to be a harmonious hole in the ceiling, you know, that there's no obvious interventions. Um, and prior to the condition survey, we'd assume because of the issues with accessing the height of the ceiling, it would have discouraged any major interventions, uh, preserving the original paint from any overpainting. But when we got up onto the scaffold, we found that actually there'd been extensive overpainting to the lower row of, of panels. The upper row tends to be more completely original. We found various areas of deterioration. I'll just show you some examples of these. So we had panels where, where previous water movement um, had caused um, salt efflorescence. We'd also, towards the end, at either end of the ceiling, the panels had lost a significant amount of the blue background due to the environmental conditions in those areas. And so we also, and I don't have a slide, but we, a survey was undertaken by a company called Vertical Access from above to look at the back of the panels, because of course, like the Ford Maddox brand, there's the, the, the paint here is totally reliant on the building envelope. And the... Um, Actually, so they worked from ropes to clean the back of the panels um, and then photographed everyone in detail so that we were all able to review because actually access is really difficult to the back of this ceiling. Um, there's another secondary ceiling that goes up oh, sorry, over, the, um, over this ceiling. Um, and generally, the plaster was in, sta in pretty sound condition. There is ev evidence of previous water ingress, but actually the, the, the lath and the nib were all very sound. Um, and where we have cracking, it's likely to be expansion cracking on the underside of the ceiling. Um, we had areas of overpaint that have failed. So this is a recreated panel, and this has quite. This is possibly one of the worst ones in terms of the later overpaint. Very significant areas of flaking. The flaking was quite widespread. Well, very widespread um, across panels. Uh, affecting, in some areas, original decoration and others later, um, later retouching. So again, here, a significant amount of flaking. So we've got um, yeah, various examples of flaking across the ceiling. Um, we've also got um, depletion of the of the coatings. So here, the gold leaf to the beaver has started to. Um, to deteriorate so we can see the, the cord design much more clearly. However, so in, in instances like this, this is an original gilded element and it's still in the light glistens very brightly. So we wouldn't seek to do anything other than to clean and conserve this because it is still a significant piece of, of, um, of the ceiling. We've got other run marks that we think may be from previous cleaning attempts. And we've also got dirty surfaces left where cleaning has not been particularly thorough in the past. We've also got some mechanical damage where um, at some point historically um, someone thought it would be a good idea to get um, helium balloons down by using an air gun. <laughs> and there are still lots of pellets embedded in the, in the ceiling. <laughs> um, so other... Other um, observations, some of the overpainting is not always terribly sympathetic. In the painting with, I'm just trying to, in the painting to the right, the um, things that look a bit like Pac-Man are Edam cheeses, um, but they've just not been very sympathetically overpainted. <laughs> um, and then we just got lots of detail on, um, on, the, on the pine, um, on the pine branches on, uh, on the other panel where it's been overpainted. 
We've also got sort of a mixture of, of original and overpaint. So this panel has been really extensively overpainted apart from the beautiful decoration on the fans, which is original um, and is actually the, the most um, detailed glaze work on the whole ceiling. But also, curiously, this panel has been overpainted with um, quite a strong pink, um, which doesn't appear anywhere else on the ceiling. And we haven't done any analysis on this, but it's possible during the redecorations they've used an unstable uh, pigment, so it might have been a different colour and it's now um, chemically altered and, and we see, uh, see the pink that we have here. So we recorded the condition panel by panel um, as we found it on, e on, each, on each panel so that we could put together conservation proposals and, and a strategy for how we were going to approach this because we had some panels that were largely original and quite intact, other original ones that were hugely failing and um, then panels that have been extensively overpainted. So we were trying to um, reach a balance that addressed all of these issues. And we were not intending this to be a restoration. Um, it's very much conservers found, partly because we've got those panels that have been overpainted that started as um, Prussia and Austria and are now different um, and now represent different countries. So any form of restoration would not really be ethical. We're very much um, about preserving what we have for future generations, whilst at the same time ensuring that people can enjoy it from ground level, so making sure that it's as visible as possible. So in terms of the conservation requirements, we set um, um, four ground rules. No deleterious materials to be introduced to the fabric, so anything we introduce should not cause harm. Um, the, uh, and also, actually, it should be re reversible. And that's, that's a fundamental principle of conservation, that anything we, re we introduce now should be reversible. Um, the appearance of the treated area should, uh, should be improved in that we want to enhance it for people to see from the ground, but we're not looking to restore it, um, and that the intervention should be as minimal as possible. So in terms of just informing ourselves about how we were going to approach it, we wanted to understand uh, more about the technique. And here we took tiny samples from the ceiling um, using a scalpel, mounted them up in resin and polished through them. So we get a cross section through the paint film. Uh, and that tells us a lot of information. So I don't have a pointer to be able to point, but um, the white layers at the bottom are the ground layers on, on the plaster. So we've got a white lead paint and then a zinc oil paint and then we come to a sort of green and blue layer. So the green and blue layer is the background paint on the ceiling. That's the original scheme. Um, there's emerald green in there, so we've got arsenic as well as lead on the ceiling. So when we're working around it, we have to be mindful of, of, of uh, health and safety. Um, and we've also got cobalt blue in there, um, creating this, dark, uh, this rich um, blue-green background. So we know it was intended not to be a strong blue um, like warm blue, it was intended to be a greenish blue. Um, the, the later greyish layers that you can see over the top, they are the current paint scheme, um, which is actually, so cross section is going to be a bit deceiving because th they look one colour in cross section, but when you see them by eye, um, they're another. So these are actually the blue background to the overpainted panels. And this is from the same panel, but from an area of gilding, so we can see the gold leaf applied on it. I just quickly wanted to touch also, so as well as that great hall ceiling, at the end we've got the starry night ceiling that sits over the organ gallery, which is a stone vaulted ceiling, so a different set of circumstances, a very or masonry vault anyway. Um, so instead of being plaster on lath, we've got a, a weight of masonry sitting above it. Um, historically, the roof has been problematic in this area, which has led to a lot of failure and salting, so we undertook... Um, some small plaster repairs to, uh, to this area, um, as well as consolidating the paint films that were there and, re and um, recreating the lost areas. We also here undertook some paint analysis and we were quite excited to find a scheme that predates um, the, uh, anything else. And uh, we, I, part of me wonders whether this might be one of the panels that Heaton, Butler and Bain painted out as a trial. 
So we've got quite a bright blue and gilding underneath that, um, underneath the scheme that correlates to the Great Hall. Um, so we did a very small amount of uncovering and found quite a different scheme sitting underneath the Starry Night. It's very small, that's sort of 10 centimetres by a centimetre, but um, um, the, uh, there is gilding on there as well, but in order not to damage it, that's not been uncovered. So that, that's, the first, that's the first public showing of this. <laughs> um, going back to the Great Hall ceiling, we undertook cleaning trials to establish what was possible, what was appropriate. Um, all of the different colours on the ceiling, uh, some are more sensitive than others, so every colour had to have a different approach to cleaning. It, it, was, um, it had to be very carefully planned that we wouldn't overclean one area so that it was brighter. It had to sit together as a whole without causing any loss of any material. Um, so there's further cleaning trials. So Canada is actually a repainted panel, so it's actually much more robust than the, um, the original panels. We also had a lot of flaking to deal with. Um, this is uh, the panel Holland, which took days and days and days of consolidation to lay back, carefully lay back the flaking paint. And we do that by injecting an adhesive underneath the paint and then very carefully um, softening the paint and the adhesive with what we call a heated spatula, which is the, um, the instrument you can see being used in the top corner. Um, and this reactivates the, the adhesive because it's thermoplastic and it lays everything back. So the, the, um, the bottom inset is that area after it's been consolidated with all the paint flakes re-secured, stuck back to the surface and laid flat. We, um, we clean the gilding. So this is a trial cleaning to the gilding where you can see the brighter um, gold following cleaning. And a small but satisfying video <laughs> of cleaning the gilding. We, uh, unfortunately, the paint didn't clean as, as readily as the gold, so that took a lot longer and we had to take a lot more care over it. Um, this is a cleaning trial to um, Denmark, showing the, the improvement in, in um, tone following cleaning. So as well as cleaning and, and, um, and consolidating, we obviously also had to retouch those losses. So. This is uh, Victoria Regina. The, the, we saw this earlier that the paint was failing quite extensively, so we, we prepared and consolidated and, um, and then retouched and re-gilded the, pan the panel with the lion on. And in fact, in the end, so this was an overpainted scheme already. There was no original on this one. And in fact, we took the decision to repaint that square, uh, to re-gild that square entirely with the, with the lion in um, because um, the surface was very uneven and from the ground, you'd have been able to see variations in it. So that's probably the greatest area of um, intervention in the ceiling. Um, we also retouched, you saw earlier, the, the loss on the Starry Night ceiling and reintegrated the, um, the stars. And that was all gilding as well. So, um, And these are sneak peeks of the, um, the finished panels. So this is courtesy of Manchester City Council. This is uh, America following completion. And another also from Manchester City Council showing the, um, the first shots of the scaffolding coming down. And this is exciting for us because this is the first time we've been, as Conservatives, been able to see it close to, but um, with bottom and top rows together because we've had scaffold lifts in there the whole time we've been working on it. So this is the first time we've seen the, um, the ceiling in its entirety. So um, I've come to the end of the talk and I just wanted to say thank you to Manchester City Council, to Lendlease, who are the principal contractors and have been amazing and supportive, and to Purcell, the architects. And then some blatant advertising for... <laughs> <laughs>